Welcome to the second part of the Missile Slug story explained. If you haven't seen part 1, you should probably go watch it first, link in the description. I originally intended to divide the series into two videos, but realized that the second part would be too long if I do that, so instead I decided to make it three parts in total, with this video covering the events of Mesa Slug 6 and 4. And if you are rightfully confused about this odd choice of entries, well it's simply because this is how the chronological events of the series go. Mesa Slug 6 happens right after 3 and is followed directly by 4. 5 and 7 are the last games chronologically speaking and will be covered in part 3. So without further ado, here's the Missile Slug story explained, part 2. After the climactic war that ended with the victory of humans against the Mars people and Metal Slug 3, the world was at peace which lasted a bit longer this time, especially that Morden completely disappeared after being rescued by his soldiers. Inside the Peregrine Falcon squad, Marco and Terma thought they could finally obtain their resignations and profit from their long-awaited retirement, but they were wrong again as their superiors forced them to stay in service just in case something bad happens in the future, and something bad will happen for sure. In fact, it was already happening. The Intel division started reporting sightings of aliens UFOs and mysterious giant creatures. Although no new interactions were reported, there were doubts that Morden and his rebel army may be involved with these occurrences as well. The last report was about a very suspicious military activity in a mountainous region in Africa. And so, the usual four, Marco and Terma from the Peregrine Falcon squad, with Ari and Fio from the Sparrow's Intel Division, were dispatched in the designated location to investigate. But just moments before their mission started, they met two new faces who were going to assist their group. The higher-ups had previously asked the assistance of a private mercenary group called the Ikari Warriors, who had sent two of their best soldiers, Ralph Jones and Clark Steele. Although our four heroes had never met their new comrades in person, they had certainly heard about them, as the two mercenaries' prowess in the battlefields was legendary. Not only were they experts in using all types of firearms, they were also deadly in close quarter combat. Ralph was famous for his capability of destroying tanks with his bare hands, while his partner Clark had the habit of easily sending his enemies several meters in the air before letting them crash on his shoulders. They had also heard that the two men often participated into unusual fighting competitions, but these were probably just rumors. Dropped in the middle of the savanna, the regulars didn't have to go far before meeting rebel soldiers as they expected. They were in the middle of gathering their troops and getting ready for some future operation that the peregrines weren't aware of. They destroyed their working supply train and continued their way through the mountains. Once they reached the caves, they found the rebels' giant excavating machine used to dig caves in order to search for some unknown underground location. Although it was not originally designed for combat, the machine proved to be a deadly weapon. Leaving the mountains behind them, their route led them to a village where they were met by a hostile resistance from the locals. The villagers had allied themselves with the rebels for some reason and attacked the regulars without hesitation. Going further through the nearby forest, Marco and his friends encountered the Mars people who seemed to be helping the rebels again despite their very recent history of betrayal. The peregrines wreaked havoc among their human and alien enemies until they reached a dead end. It was then when they were attacked by the rebels' latest weapon, the Iron Sentinel, a giant rocket launching tank. The fight took place while going down the hill at full speed.
The tank was destroyed when it crashed at the bottom of the hill, revealing that it was Morden who was the one operating it with the help of his alien friends. He managed to subdue our heroes, but before he could do anything, a new type of creatures suddenly attacked him and started eating the Mars people. Injured, Morden explained that he was working with the Martians after they asked him for help to rescue their leader Root Mars from the bottom of the ocean. The reason for their desperate plea of help was because they were themselves attacked by their natural predators, an alien species called the Invaders. Morden and the Mars people were trying to defeat this new threat on their own by finding their underground main base and kill their king. But the invaders came sooner than they thought and the regular intervention didn't help as well. Because of that, humanity was in a dire situation since the invaders would not stop at the Martians. Humans were a target as well. Having no choice in the matter, the regular army decided to help and ally with the rebels again and the Mars people for the first time against this common fearsome enemy. The invaders began their attack. The first major hit location was a Chinese city where the group were sent to eliminate the invaders' presence. They found that despite their animal and overall wild appearance, the invaders were in actuality an advanced species with superior technological capabilities that allowed them to take control over the city armed vehicles and use them against the humans. However, peregrines, sparrows, and ikaris forced the invaders to withdraw to the sewers where the group followed them and finished every single one of them. Unfortunately, it was a setup from the sly aliens who had previously prepared a robot controlled by an artificial brain to ambush Marco and the rest. The brain robot was a tough enemy that used different types of projectiles against our heroes. It also knew how to take advantage of its surrounding by tossing vehicles at them and using the sewer's water to unleash a destructive electric attack. As soon as they dealt with their creepy enemy, their next mission ordered them to take back the bridge from the invaders where Root Mars was originally being rescued. They believed that the Martian's leader would certainly be of a great help against the invaders. Once the bridge was clear, they shifted their focus to the skies above it in order to cleanse it from the winged breed of these ruthless aliens. While some of our heroes used a boring aircraft to do so, others were helped by none other than the leader of the Mars people, Root Mars, in this aerial battle. Once on the bridge again, the regulars met with the rebels before they were all attacked by a monstrosity that looked like like a giant centipede. The rebel soldiers fled in fear, leaving our heroes to deal with the threat on their own. But they were more than capable of destroying the monster without any help. After learning the location of the impact site where the invaders had landed, our heroes launched an ultimate attack in combination with the rebel army and the Mars people. Unsurprisingly, a fierce resistance from their enemies was waiting for them, but the already excavated cave helped them advance more or less smoothly through the various hostile creatures, crab-like tanks, insect sentinels, and all sorts of strange beings and weaponry. Eventually, they reached a dead end and had to dig their way even further down, using their brand new slug diggers. The way down was no cakewalk either. The invaders had already set a great number of tricky landmines in addition of a breed of insect-like aliens that lived inside Earth called the scavengers, who would turn into walking bombs once they detect an intruder. Our heroes ended up reaching the invaders' hive, a fleshy and organic area where many Mars people were captured and who, once freed, they expressed their gratitude either by fighting alongside them or by giving our heroes precious ammunition. One member of the group, however, was too eager to reach the invaders' king and went on ahead alone. After fighting their way through the hive, rescuing many Martians and destroying even more invaders' troops, our heroes reached spots that usually Alan O'Neill would pick to ambush them. But this time, it was the previously missing peregrine soldier who attacked them, apparently mind controlled by an invader parasite. Thankfully, the impatient soldier regained their self-control once the parasite was destroyed. 
At last, they arrived to a chamber where the invader king resided while protecting itself inside a cocoon. The group unleashed all their firepower toward the source of evil while the latter summoned its own fighters to protect itself. Rebel soldiers also joined the fight, lending a much appreciated help, and with their combined forces, they managed to destroy the cocoon and its occupant with it, but not really. In fact, they just angered the giant alien who launched a deadly beam, killing all the rebels present in the spot. The invader king had just decided to fight. It had the faculty to produce different types of energy beams and laser waves that were extremely deadly and hard to dodge. And every now and then, the monster got too angry and launched a particularly strong projectile that destroyed the platform beneath our heroes, forcing them into going down each time. But the worst part was, the invader king was invulnerable to all types of weapons. Shooting its head, which usually works in this kind of situations, didn't seem to do anything to it. Their only option was to keep avoiding its attacks and hope for the best. Then a miracle happened, the monster destroyed the last platform, unaware that there was nothing beneath it this time. Our heroes fell into a bottomless pit, but were able to escape death by holding onto the edge. The invader king however wasn't as flexible and fell all the way to its imminent doom. The impact of its fall created a huge explosion that blinded our heroes and forced them to lose their grip. They were going to meet the same fate as the monster, but in an unexpected twist, they were saved by their former enemies, Root Mars and Morden. Since that day, they forgot about their past and they all became best friends. They even shared their phone numbers and email addresses. Not even a year had passed after this insane alien adventure that a new threat rose. This time, it was 100% human. The regular army's intel division reported rumors about the imminent outbreak of a computer virus known as White Baby. The virus was so powerful that it could break through any bank security system, but the scariest thing about it was that it could take control over military systems of all countries around the world. Upon further investigation, the Intel division learned that the group behind the cyber terror is a syndicate called Amadeus. Against such menace, the regular army could not stay idle. The extermination of this group became a top priority, and so the Peregrine Falcons were deployed to wipe out Amadeus. While Terma and Ari were tasked to search for an antivirus and eliminate the threat from the war's network, Marco and Fio's mission was to fight the Syndicate's armed troops in the battlefield. Replacing Ari and Terma, two new recruits joined the commando. Trevor, a programmer with a deep understanding of computer languages and even deeper respect for Marco. The second recruit was Nadia, who just recently joined the Sparrows for a very unique reason. Her initial objective was to become a model, but couldn't stop gaining weight due to her appetite. So she enlisted herself in the military, believing that the intense physical work that comes with this lifestyle will help maintain her weight down. Our six heroes succeeded in hacking into a satellite belonging to Amadeus and learned the identity of the mastermind behind the terrorist group, a mad scientist known as the Doctor. More interesting was the identity of the Doctor's ally, who turned now to be none other than good old General Morden. But the most crucial info they learned was the planned attack of a communications facility that could be used to spread the white baby virus across the world. With no time to waste, our heroes began their move. First, they had to weaken the enemy supply forces, and their target was the bridge of the new Godokin city where their enemy's main supply tool was located. 
As expected, the city was filled to the brim with the rebel soldiers in addition of Amadeus forces, including scientists who developed a type of poison capable of turning humans into monkeys. Even though he was tasked with combating the white baby virus, Terma managed to find the time to assist the squad from inside a vehicle. Once they arrived at the bridge, they found the rebels blimp, which also acted as their main supply and transportation tool. It also had a formidable defensive power, making it very hard to destroy. But the peregrines fought well and landed serious damage to the blimp, severely undermining its effectiveness and forcing it to withdraw. They had no time for celebrating this small victory, as Airy urged them to proceed to their next objective, which was Gerhard City, the same town that used to be the rebels' headquarters during the First Modern War and was taken again by Modern's troops. With the dispatch of the metal slugs taking time, our heroes had to use the enemy's own tanks against them. Some of the prisoners of war who were rescued decided to help them cross the bridge between the city and reach 256 by driving the land seek while the Paragis dealt with the enemy air forces. They met a familiar face at the end of the road. Alan O'Neill was adamant in stopping our hero's progression with the help of other rebel soldiers. This time, he was operating a giant armed tower developed by Amadeus Syndicate. With each section of it destroyed, the tower's attacks became deadlier. Nevertheless, the regulars managed to overcome this obstacle and were congratulated by Airy, who came to pick them up. Next mission was Gardhert Valley, which just like Gerhard City, was taken over once again by the rebels. The enemy had anticipated the peregrines' arrival and ambushed their drop point by pretending to be snowmen, but that didn't fool our heroes one bit. However, some of them had to deal with the real snowmen hidden deep down the mountain, while the others, who chose to descend the mountain downwards, were met by a ferocious resistance from their enemies. Luckily, gravity was on their side. But the fun time ended when they were confronted by the Iron, a giant armored combat vehicle created by Amadeus and operated by Morden in person. Adding more challenge to our heroes, many rebel helicopters came to assist the Iron, providing a very dangerous and annoying air support. Once the war machine destroyed, Morden managed to escape thanks to one of his helicopters. The regulars' next objective was in Morden homeland, Canada, where a horror amusement park was taken over by the rebels, who then started transforming the employees into real zombies and mummies using the knowledge they acquired previously from the Mars people. That led to many casualties among the innocent civilians in town and the rebel soldiers themselves. Not content with all the chaos they caused, the rebels, with the help of their Amadeus friends, had also transformed the amusement park animatronic into a creepy and deadly weapon, designed specifically to turn a large number of people into zombies, a dreadful functionality that the rebels did not hesitate in using against our heroes. But ironically, it backfired at them when some of our heroes did turn into zombies indeed, but kept fighting using their super deadly blood vomit, which destroyed the animatronic in no time. Once victorious, the group went into a crate brought by the regular army. Their next objective was to use that crate to infiltrate a cargo ship that the Amadeus Syndicate had captured. They found many rebel soldiers in addition of a group of pirates that Amadeus hired as mercenaries. The ship was loaded with different types of weaponry and equipments that were originally destined for the regular army before it fell into the hands of their enemies. Realizing that they lost control over the ship, the rebels decided to blow it up using the damaged blimp from before, which still had a non-negligible firepower. But the main danger came from underwater. Amadeus used their submarine to attack the Peregrine squad, who also had to deal with the assistance of the rebels' blimp from afar. It was a tough battle, especially that our heroes were stuck on a small piece of the sunken ship and had little room to move. 
At last, the regular army was finally able to reach the communication facility where the white baby virus was meant to be used, and immediately they launched their final impossible mission. Using a rope, our heroes descended a long tunnel while fighting the numerous soldiers of the rebel army and Amadeus syndicate. The road to the central computer was not a straightforward path and the commando had to take a long and dangerous detour to reach it. The road was full of rebel soldiers, Amadeus scientists, tanks, armored vehicles and many other obstacles that Marco and his friends had to overcome. One of these obstacles was Morden in person, who our heroes met sooner than they thought, but quickly realized that he was a robotic doppelganger, suggesting that the real Morden was probably never involved with this incident to begin with. Right after that, Alan O'Neill once again ambushed our heroes into another battle, but just like with Morden, they discovered that he too was just a robotic look-alike. When the battle ended, they took the elevator that brought them face to face against the man behind all this chaos, the doctor. The mad scientist had succeeded in weaponizing the mother computer and began using it to attack our heroes. Destroying the machine didn't shake the doctor's resolve as that was just the alpha part of the computer. He summoned the beta section next, which turned out to be even deadlier. Nevertheless, it met the same fate as the previous part. The doctor proved to be more persistent than anticipated. Using his last card, he started operating the central computer. The attacks of his machine were ridiculously hard to avoid. Our heroes were overwhelmed by bullets and laser beams from all sides. And like if that was not enough, small robots came to assist the doctor in his battle. But Marco and his friends fought well, with their combat experience, unwavering resolve, and the power of infinite continues, they destroyed the hellish machine. The doctor was stuck in it with seemingly no way of escaping. However, that victory triggered the self-destruct mechanism of the facility, and our heroes had to run as fast as they could to avoid being caught in the explosion. Thankfully, they managed to escape in the nick of time. With that, the white baby crisis came to an end, but the doctor's body was never found though. Trevor surpassed his model Marco by succeeding in retiring shortly after these events. As for Nadia, she failed miserably in achieving her objective of becoming a model after she gained a lot of weight during the feast that Terma and Aerie prepared for the group. And that was the second part of Metal Slug Story Explained. Stay tuned for the third and last part which will cover the events of Metal Slug 5 and 7. Special thanks to my patrons for their generous support. I hope you enjoyed this video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. And why not consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.